So this today is to become a crossover artist, leading through change and increasing resiliency and engagement. Let's get moving. All right. Most of you know uh, that we enjoy interacting with you all, and we use Mentimeter to do it. If you're new to this series, um, please feel free to pull out your smartphone and or open a second browser, which is whichever is easiest for you, and go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and enter the code that you see, 253290. I will also always be at the top of the screen so that you can reference that code whenever you need to. Um, most of you, as you were logging in, figured this piece out, and we asked you to consider uh, if you're stranded on an island or perhaps in your basement, uh, what one group or artist would you bring to listen to? If the word is larger, it just means that more people put that in as their vote. And so this tells us that we have a good number of Ed Sheeran and Taylor Swift fans. We've got some shout outs for you too, a little journey. I do appreciate the person who put in Rachmaninoff. Um, kudos right. to you. And also the person who managed to trip the profanity filter. So I'm not sure what band that is, but uh, the profanity filter is on. I hope they realize too that they that you don't get to take Ed Sheeran with you. You just get like to take his music, one of the CDs that you bought. I'm not sure that was entirely know. clear. So that's a good point to make now. Some of you perhaps want a vacation with Rachmaninoff. I like it. All right. Second question for you, a little bit more on topic uh, for what we're discussing today. Uh, life after COVID, will it go back to normal, kind of just like it was? Uh, have a slight impact, perhaps we're doing more online shopping, have a medium impact. Um, yes, I'm going to change my routine. I really enjoyed the evening walks. I'm going to keep those. Or have a drastic impact. I am in, all in on virtual meetings. I want to do them for life. Uh, this is going to dramatically impact how we do business. And so as we see kind of your votes coming in, and this is just a check-in on, from an opinion piece, um, how do we feel about this? We're all in some degree of change. We're all being challenged from a resilience perspective to some extent. Um, and for the majority of you, we're saying it's going to have a medium impact. There is going to be a change somehow, some way to my routine that's going to carry through even after stay-at-home is lifted and business, perhaps the economy gets turned back on. Um, so that's interesting um, how that comes out. Our second question for you all um, to wrestle with is, um, what is the biggest drain on resilience at work? And this is actually, we're gonna reveal to you what a survey said, so we did not make up these categories, but if you had to pick between juggling working life and family non-work responsibilities, volume or pace of work stretched to its limits, managing difficult relationships or politics in the workplace, um, or upheavals in, in your kind of personal life. And I apologize, I think there's a typo that we have upheavals and personal upheavals. So that's upheavals on top of upheavals. That's meant to be upheavals in your personal life. So which of these, and we'll reveal to you what the survey responded. Certainly you could argue that all of these contribute um, to this idea that we're a little less resilient um, that we could be, and it looks like a pretty even split um, between the first three. And so we'll offer for you, according to the survey that was written up in HBR, that the majority of people when asked actually reference uh, the, actually the juggling of the politics and difficult conversations at work. Um, so to the tune of 75% of people rated that as the biggest strain on resilience at work. And so what that tells us is that for a lot of us, resilience is impacted by not necessarily the micro interactions, but those individual conversations. That sometimes the bigger things don't have as dramatic effect on our resilience, but it's those small interactions and in our personal relationships where we tend to perhaps take the biggest hit. All right, um, and one final question for you all. Uh, before we go through the content that we have prepared, we wanted to check in and ask you, what's the one thing that you all do to increase your personal resilience? It can be anything um, from your work life, from your personal life, the thing that you do that you feel like, if I stick to this habit, if I make this part of my routine, I know that I will be a little bit more resilient. Um, and so we see quite a few things coming in in the, in the exercise and meditation standpoint, take a break. I like how we have everything from lift big weights to yoga. So the spectrum of physical activity. Um, remember perspective, that's a really good one. Can I get myself into a standpoint where I'm just gonna assume positive intent or that perhaps somebody else has a different perspective? 
And Sarah, if people are on the phone or if you have an issue getting into Menti, just put it into the chat and Jamie can enter it into Mentimeter for you. Mm -hmm. I do like that there was a shameless plug for Nike's advertising, just do it. And just then someone said it. fish. And I don't know if that's that they're going to eat the fish or actually go fishing, but either I way. I think it's probably go fishing. I like more hugs from my kid. I like the person who put in PlayStation or run. So it could go either way. We're either going to play video <laughs> games or we're going to go for a run. Ballroom dancing, reflection. So exercise being the one that gets the majority of the votes. So appreciate you all uh, putting in those comments. And as we switch, oh, I like the person who put drink. I'm with you. I'm not sure. If, I'm going to assume that that's have a cocktail and not drink water, but both actually could probably contribute to resilience. All right, switching over to back to our slides. We're going to start um, as we tend to do, just simply with the definition. What does it mean to be resilient? Uh, and it literally defined is the ability to withstand or recover quickly from difficult conditions. So two parts. Um, one, can I kind of weather the storm, so to speak? Um, but then it also gets into what's my recovery time? And uh, not that we're going to be robotic about it, not that we are uneffective, um, but do I understand that there are things that I can do or there's levers that I can pull that actually decrease uh, the recovery time so that I can get into something perhaps that's a little bit more productive. From a leadership standpoint, we are a leadership institute, so how do we correlate these two things? And uh, Joseph Folkman, he runs a great consultancy and they do a lot of work in the 360 space. And so they went into their 360s and they mined out for those leaders that are rated as being highly effective, uh, what was their resiliency score? And so those leaders in a high percentile of leadership effectiveness tended to be among the most resilient. Um, so not only does this affect us from a personal standpoint, uh, but it certainly impacts the people in our span of care, those who are the most effective at leadership tend to have mechanisms to which they are more resilient. So we're gonna break this down into three different pathways um, and Matt's gonna take, take you through the first one. Oops, I apologize. Matt, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, my apologies. Uh, just really quick, the human brain, just to look at the biology of this, it burns energy about 10 times faster when it's under stress, shifts energy away from the prefrontal core, cortex. So the part that is basically a rational juggling complex tasks and the planning of this. And when we say, okay, well, why are you bringing up the human brain under stress? Well, if we look at right now, the times we're in, we could describe this as there's a lot of uncertainty, there's some anxiety, perhaps some wouldn't label this as fear. Um, some of the questions that we're asking, when will the stay at home be lifted for your particular country, your particular state? If you're in the U.S., perhaps even your particular city or county, when will my business return? When uh, will my business return? Um, for the U.S., this is a U.S. piece, but the, the payment loan, the, uh, the paycheck loan, will I get that? Is there a recession that follows and how long will that be? I um, might, might have health concerns or business pressure. Perhaps I'm leading a really remotely and that's a lot of change. Maybe you're an essential business. So you really wrestle with a lot of these issues of how am I putting my people, am I putting them in harm's way or not? So a lot of these questions leads to, that is just a lot of stress on the mind. So when we think about increasing resiliency, we break this down into these three areas, as Sarah mentioned, individually, both during change and then as a team. And so we're gonna look at individually, like during the storm, during the turbulent times, what can we do? So individually, and I love that we asked you all, what do you do to increase your resiliency? And I know some of you put drink. Hey, look, everyone, I found the vodka. It was hiding in the orange juice kind of thing. I'm not sure we recommend that one. Just to say this, there's a lot of studies out there. And this, I think, is very true. And you even put it in when we asked you, how do you stay a little more resilient? Well, a lot of you talked about either meditation. I know I saw some of you put in pray. So you put in either run or PlayStation, perhaps there is woodworking, fishing, eating better, yoga, all of these things are, are proven to be very true from a resiliency standpoint. And straight out of military training, absolutely. My physical well-being, my mental well-being, all of these things are part of it. However, we're not going to go down this angle. I think this is the information that's known, it's accepted, people know to do this, and they do do this. And it does help with some resiliency. So we're going to give you a little bit different lens on this, hopefully that adds to this and is uh, yeah, it's additive rather than us just repeating the usual stuff. 
going to be really gentle on this one, and I'm going to try and find this out. And if I miss this, sir, if you can join in and help me here. But resilience does not equal optimism. Um, what I need is a grounded sense of reality and your thinking on the issue versus kind of the mindless, raw, raw, cheering person. Uh, there'll be a time for that, perhaps later. But during the thick of things, during the stress, during the times that we're trying to solve a problem or work our way out, the person that just simply says, I'm the eternal optimist and it's all going to be okay and we're going to make it out of here, um, that actually doesn't drive resilience. Like there's a lot of studies out there that show um, it actually fights against that. What I need is your best thinking on this versus just um, it's going to be fine. It's the Titanic. How could it go down? It's, it's made in voyage. It was built really large. Those type of things. So just to level set. It's not a bad character trait or anything, but it's also not what resilience is. So what is it then? Well, let's get into that. One, from an individual standpoint, resilient people have a very sober and simply down-to-earth view of those parts of reality that matter for survival. And so it's kind of facing down reality, if you will. I focus on what I can control and influence versus what I can't control. Focusing on what's out of my control, I, move, I put my energies into what can I control, what can I influence. And at the end, as mentioned, if you join us a little late, we're going to provide all of these slides and some resources and tools to help you with this. But one of the questions you would ask are, what possibilities does this current circumstance present? As I think my way through, I'm facing down some real reality. The second part is going to take a little framing, and we were thinking about how do we talk about meaning in a little bit different way, especially since COVID has happened and people like to talk about, hey, we're all in this together. When Voyagers 1 and 2 were launched, Voyager 1 right now is the furthest man-made, uh, human-made uh, piece of equipment or anything touched or made by humans uh, furthest away from the entire world. As it was traveling away out of our solar system, Carl Sagan from the Planetary Society, he asked them to turn it around and take a picture of Earth. And this is Earth, this pale blue dot. And his quote here, there is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits in this distant image of our tiny world. It underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. So what if I were to put that into a little music, a little video, and when someone puts his voice and reading his statement under a little bit of music, this is what it looks like. We were hunters and foragers. The frontier was everywhere. We were bounded only by the earth and the ocean and the sky. The open road still softly calls like a nearly forgotten song of childhood. We have wandered among the wanderers. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle. Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the only home we've ever known. Uh, not a commercial for Tesla, sorry, not an endorsement by us. Uh, for Tesla, and Tesla didn't make that. There were fans of Tesla Model S's that, uh, that put Carl Sagan's speech there to music and then introduced uh, the Tesla automobile for other reasons that we won't go into right now. But just to say, when we're looking at the meaning part of this, sometimes it is this grandiose part. Uh, Voyager 1, as I mentioned, launched back in, I think, 1977. It has two gold discs on it. And it says, to the makers of music, all world, all times, they thought... Uh, NASA thought that perhaps if it ever falls into the hands of uh, artificial life, if something exists out there, that they would understand humanity. And so on this disc, they actually put some music. Johnny Be Good by Chuck Berry, Symphony No. 5 and C minor by Beethoven, Greens in 55 languages. For whatever reason, we decided to include whale songs. 
and in Morse code is Praspera ad Astra, which means through hardships to the stars. And fun little fact here, the Voyager team wanted to include Here Comes the Sun by the Beatles, but EMI, their producer of the record, uh, declined for copyright reasons. So the transition for this and the second part of individual, I know we've got down this space track here, but the second part of individual resiliency is to make sense to have this search for meaning. It's the propensity, the ability to make meaning of difficult times uh, in the person. So again, not the optimism part, but to make meaning of it. Um, as an example, COVID, for people to make meaning of this, we were all in this together. And we start looking at what's the reality of this. So what we would offer is an organizational part, an individual, center your conversations, your decision-making, uh, your communication, especially around your purpose and values. And I would ask yourself, what's the current time teaching us not about how to survive this, but what's it teaching us about surviving the next, perhaps, disturbance that might be there? So this is a good example of how we make sense of the meaning. And if we're talking about meaning and we're talking about purpose, there is probably no one uh, better qualified to quote than Viktor Frankl. And we are no longer able to change the situation. We are challenged to change ourselves. The way we do that is we search for that meaning and we have this grounded sense of reality in this. I'm going to move into the next area, and that is virtualized ingenuity, sir. All right. So building on our third element from individual resilience, ritualized ingenuity, um, which is defined as the ability to make do with whatever is at hand. And so remarkably during this time, and I think if you have examples, I would welcome you to put those into chat. Certainly businesses and organizations have been fairly ingenious with how they are delivering their product or their service to market. Restaurants or steakhouses are turning into butcher shops. As an example, we can't necessarily cook the food for you, but we can actually provide the food and you can cook it in your home. How do I get my product or service into your hands in new ways? And so you see kind of the upcycle movement um, in the photos people who are taking and rather than I can't particularly recycle this object but I can actually upcycle it and give it to give it a new life. Um, so how does this apply to the situation that we're in? Um, how do I gather with my team and say we do have some resources? Um, how do we repurpose, repackage, reuse the things that we already have? Um, what core components of your business can we actually remix to deliver a new service? And what are you really, really good at? And um, what's the thing that you do better than anyone else? And how do I get that product into people's hands when I can't do it in the traditional way? Um, and so when you think about all of these things as they come combined from an individual resiliency standpoint, um, do I have that grounded sense of optimism? Do I understand to what end? What's the meaning I'm going to make of the situation, of the role that we can play inside the situation? And can I do whatever I can with what I happen to have available to me. And just glancing over um, in the chat, we've got one modified global tech supply chain to assist with PPE uh, supply chain management. Okay, great example. Um, so if I have anything that can help in the fight to get PPE to the people who need it, is my business providing that? So great example. Uh, teletherapy is actually more intensive sometimes than face-to-face. -face. Um, so that's an interesting one, one that I hadn't heard. Um, so if you're used to engaging therapy, do I do it in a remote standpoint? Um, it can be just as effective or perhaps this person is suggesting more effective. Um, another great example. Um, and not to make light of these examples, but as we were trying to brainstorm, well, what's something that is really kind of ingenious? And we started to think about an entire generation of children that will never know what it is like to beat on the ketchup bottle. And so proof that we're all going to be okay on this pale blue dot is we offer to you the squeezable ketchup bottle. Um, so sometimes there are ingenious things that deliver music to the heavens, and sometimes we think about the squeezable ketchup bottle. So increased resilience individually, facing down reality, um, search for meaning, how do I connect purpose to what I do, um, and how do I make the best with what I have? We also know that we have this component that we're layering in about change. And so it's not just can I be resilient in my day-to-day -day life, but especially right now, we're all being um, asked to absorb a tremendous amount of change again and again and again. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about from a human standpoint, how do we all process change? And then what can we do from a leadership standpoint to help people navigate? The way that we're going to do this is by asking you to reflect on a couple of changes that you've experienced in your past. 
Um, and so this is really, really important. Uh, I don't want you to think of anything that you're currently wrestling with. Um, so nothing having to do with COVID. And I know that's on our top of our minds, but I don't want you to think of a present day change. I want you to think of one that you have fully processed. Um, the first one I want you to think of is the change that you chose. So something that you elected to do is if I was to give a personal example, um, I would pick choosing to move to St. Louis. It's a 4,000 mile move away from home. It was a big deal. I was 18. I went on my own, um, but it was something that I had complete control over. It was 100% my choice. I had other options um, versus a change that was inflicted on you. Um, so I want you to think of something that you had very little or absolutely no say in. If I was to give you an example, I would think back um, in my career uh, to uh, being in the position of having our very, very small kind of culture team inside our parent company be absorbed into a much larger department. Um, didn't have a say in it. My whole world changed uh, within a few day time period and um, had to make some really personal choices about work based on that change being inflicted on me. So change I chose, a change that was inflicted. Um, so I want you to hold both of those in your mind um, and just to note it can be personal or professional. Um, and we're gonna go back into Mentimeter and I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions about those changes. Um, for the first one, a change that you chose, that story in which you had complete control, I want you to think about your first reaction not after you've processed it, like the minute you made the decision, you're like, I'm going to do this. What was your default, that first initial reaction, like, hell yes, ready to go. Um, I chose it, but I still need some more information. Um, me on the cannons, I actively resist my own change or, oh, expletive, this is terrifying. So your first default reaction, change that you chose. And if you want to put that reaction into the chat, if you can't use Mentimeter, feel free to do that as well um, as we see these coming in. Um, a good percentage of people that are in that kind of like ready to go, perhaps I need some more information. <laughs> I need to ask a few questions, get some data, uh, but a good majority who say I'm ready to go with this and then a few who say I chose it, but this is actually terrifying. So appreciate you all doing that. Now I'm gonna ask you the same response, but for the change that was inflicted on you. I want your gut first default reaction. So the second you heard about it, the very first thing, change was announced, you did not have any input. Was it, hell yes, ready to go. Um, appreciate the announcement, I'm gonna need some more information. Was it man the cannons, I'm going to actively resist this change or was it, oh, expletive, this is terrifying. And so as we see these come in, we see a broader spectrum. And um, there are still a handful of people who are like, cool, yep, I'm ready to go. Didn't have a say in it, but that's perfectly fine. Um, a good percentage of people were pretty split evenly between, I'm gonna need some more information. I'm going to actively resist. So no active resistors in the first group. Um, I'm going to actively resist this. Um, and then a good percentage of people who say, this is terrifying. So as we reflect on just, that short brief exercise, um, we're going to talk about what this reveals to us about how people um, actually process change. Um, and if we were to do this in a large group, um, here are some of the things that people might say. We can go to the next slide. In general, people have a more favorable reaction to change that they chose. And so it's not always um, but typically, we've run this activity with probably thousands of people at this point, um, and typically it works out exactly the same way it did in the polling. If I got to choose it, I'm much more likely to say I'm all on board. In general, people are more likely to resist um, changes that are inflicted on them. It just is a little bit part of our hardwiring and DNA, not always, but in general. We know that the less information, so in both, both camps, um, there were people who were like, hold on, I just need more information before I can tell you how I feel about it. Um, so the less information people have could increase that resistance. I mean, certainly change can be very contextual to the individual. I would use a divorce as kind of a classic example for some people that is inflicted on them and they have a very negative reaction. Um, and for some people they might say, I'm, I'm perfectly fine. That is a hell yes kind of moment for me. Um, so the same type of change, um, but very different reactions. And so if we're to look at it this from more of just kind of a processing lens, 
Um, this is how people, how humans process change. If you are human, this applies to you. None of us get out of this. This is simply how we are hardwired. And um, when we become aware of a change, feedback is delivered, the change is announced, um, typically we're gonna experience some kind of emotion. Um, again, this is just called being human. That emotion might be that a little bit of anxiety, um, perhaps a little bit of fear, uh, that resistance might kick in a little bit. I have some kind of reaction. Um, internally, what happens is I have to go through a process whereby I start to rationalize the feedback or the change for me. Um, and essentially what this means is um, I need to make sense of it for myself. I then need to be able to attach to it. Um, and I'm starting in the thoughts that might occur to somebody are, okay, I could see how this could work out. I could see how I could manage this. Then I start to anticipate, all right, this is coming, I'm gonna anticipate the change. Then I'm ready for action. And so we call this, the term that we have for this is um, in the box. Um, I go from, I'm aware of the change, I go through all of this processing, and then I'm ready to leave the box. The one surefire way to sabotage the change process is to skip the in the box, to expect that I told you about the change and I expect that you're gonna go straight to action. Um, and we do this all the time and oftentimes when we do this is when leadership teams meet, they thoughtfully consider a change, they write out a beautiful communication strategy, they lay out the change and instantly expect that people can transition on a dime. Well, the reason that happens is for the leadership team or whomever the group is that's responsible for the change, they've had time to process. They have gone through the box. They've fully processed it. Uh, but then you have a new population, population of people receiving the change that haven't had that luxury. So what do we do about it in a change process? I want to increase people's resiliency and I want for people to be able to absorb and be resilient to the change. So the first piece is where possible, I need to gather input on the front end. Wherever and whenever possible, I need to gather that input. I need to design the communication strategy to be two-way. I need to be able to, yes, perhaps transmit, um, but I also want to build in opportunities to listen. Um, it's really, really powerful simply to acknowledge that people are in the box. It goes a long way to say, I know that this is fast. I know that you're in the box, or I know that you're still processing. However, time is critical or whatever it happens to be, but I can at least acknowledge that I'm putting you in this position. Um, if possible, I can provide options within the change. Um, perhaps um, I can't, the change is happening. Uh, there's nothing I can do about that part, but the way you absorb the change, the options that I give you, um, I can perhaps ask for, for some choice. Um, I can default to asking open-ended questions, and we're going to give um, you a tool for that. Um, I can separate the announcement of the change and the asking of feedback. And so, for example, um, out of respect, we're going to let you know, team, that this change is happening. Um, I'm going to ask for your feedback tomorrow. Um, but respectfully, I don't want to put you in the position of processing it all at once. And so we're going to separate this into two parts. Where possible, I'm going to give opportunities for ownership. Um, can certain people take parts of the change and be able to do it? Um, and then I'm going to be really open to iteration, tweaks, and evolution. And so it goes a long way with a team to say, we probably didn't get this exactly correct. And so I'm going to need some help um, as we iterate the application of this as we move forward. One of the things that's really powerful as we announce the change is to lean into open-ended questions. And so both when I'm asking for feedback, um, but also for team members so that we're all doing this for each other. Um, and just defined very simply, closed questions being yes, no, leading questions uh, being, I'll give you an example, closed question would be, did you enjoy this webinar? Leading question would be, the webinar was good, right? Open question was, uh, how did you enjoy or how did you experience the webinar? Closed, leading, and open. So as this applies to perhaps some change that we might be announcing, um, here are some op great open-ended questions for you to ask. What concerns do you have? How can you make this idea better? Um, Curious, uh, we've thought this through, but I would love to know what unintended consequences of this change could there be. Um, this method cultivates curiosity. It encourages people to listen. Um, it helps advance the idea and it's shared ownership. So the, the idea or the change no longer belongs just to me versus closed questions. Do you agree with this change? Can you administer this change? Will you execute this change? If I go into that yes, no mode, it starts to feel like a cross-examination. Um, and it starts to feel like I'm just trying to advance my own agenda 
um, and the ownership stays with the questioner and it suddenly is not a group conversation. Matt, anything to add on that? Uh, the only thing to add on this is the reason we brought this up in some resilience through change is when the studies are showing about change management or change efforts in organizations, uh, about 70% fail, but that's due to employee resistance. And so it might seem like this is a little bit like, oh, okay, great. We can listen. We can ask open-ended questions. This allows people to lean in more to whatever that change is and be engaged and not have your change efforts fail. And I think just presenting you back to you audience is very few of you said that life post COVID is going to be exactly the same. And so you are going through this, your people are going through this, this is the way, and I know there are a lot of change management theories and, and steps, but this is the basics of it. And a lot of it is listening, asking for that feedback and these open-ended questions. As we transition into uh, the team, so increasing resilience, See, and I'm just to say this, right? Being a resilient in, as an individual, being viewed as a resilient leader requires that you bring others along with you, whether this is nonprofit, for profit, military, et cetera. This is really what being a resilient leader is about. Uh, the most helpful thing a person can do is to listen under this seek to understand. And we're going to get into an empathy piece, and I'll just tell you I'm looking at my watch here, I'll just tell you a very, very short story of this where it has a business impact. Now, one of my assignments in the military was to build a, the Air Operations Center in the Middle East. And so I was in Saudi Arabia, and the, the arrangement was that 95% of this construction project was to be purchased on the Saudi economy. So I was the business liaison for this, this, uh, this project. And I can remember I came on site, and all of our, our construction crews were out there, and they were complaining about this one person. His name was Saeed. And Saeed was a, a vendor to the US military and was providing some equipment and materials and those type of things. And just complain after complain, and he's the reason we're late and he's the reason we're behind. And so they're getting me all riled up and I'm always in for, for, a, for a good battle. And so I called up Saeed, I said, hey, this is who I am. I want your stuff off my site. I did not call it stuff. And get down here and get it all over. And if you're not, if he doesn't, if it's not off my property, off the job site, by the close of business today, uh, that it becomes proper to the U.S. government. Now, is that true? No, of course not, but I like to play a, a poker hand, even if I don't have one. So he comes in, and he's, we're talking about these type of things, and there was a piece of equipment that the crew was asking for. It was a large piece of uh, equipment, earth-moving equipment, and I was telling him, it's late, you don't have it, and he was making excuses, and I said, just get your stuff off my site, and he said, you know, the problem with you Americans are that you don't listen, and so then I started to argue with him, and I thought, it's like that flash that you have in your life, and you think, huh, I'm arguing with somebody about not listening. Maybe there's a point here. So I said, all right, you got 30 seconds. And he just said, you can't get that piece of equipment in Saudi Arabia. It doesn't exist. Now, I can ship it in. Here's the extra cost. I'm giving you this as an alternative. And so I just kept listening and kept listening. And it turned out that Saeed was right about a lot of things that I think myself, uh, I had not really understood the true landscape of it of the environment there and the differences, having a Western mindset about this construction project. Saeed became kind of my business advisor. I used him to check up on other vendors. Um, it's not my leadership, but I would say it's more on Saeed and the act of listening is the reason that uh, that, that group was able to complete the project on time below uh, budget and actually got to go home for the holidays. Uh, and if I had just told him off and told him to get off the site, which would have felt really good, uh, it would not have happened. And so and we still keep in touch today. But I remember that moment about being able to listen. Um, listening, it feels like it's a very passive thing. And for those of you that do it and do it well, you will notice that you are exhausted by the end of the day if you're in this. It also helps someone else out. So when we talk about our own resiliency, there's a way that I can increase someone else's resiliency. And it's really interesting. All of us walk around day to day with a balance of logic and emotion. Perhaps we're more logical, perhaps we're a little more emotional uh, in our, but we have a balance that's true to us. So this is called our homeostasis. This is where I live, between some amount of logic, some amount of emotion. As I go through the day or as change happens, a lot of times, especially as you noticed, if it's inflicted on me, my emotions start to increase. As my emotions start to increase, my logic starts to get pushed out. Some of you might say, oh, on the extreme parts of this, it's an amygdala hijack, like it's fight or flight. Yeah, the extreme side, but even in the mellow parts of this, I start to have a little more emotion. It makes it more challenging 
for me to think because my logical part of my brain is kind of being forced out. What helps someone return is the ability to vent out some of that emotion. But the key to venting is you have to have someone there to listen. This is why venting to yourself in your, in your car, alone, whatever, it doesn't work. Listening provides that ability to vent and it allows the person to return back to a balance of logic and emotion. This is why there are times in a heated discussion and you notice what was the number one thing that people said fights against the resiliency at work and that was difficult relationships or running the politics. It's why later on, if you're in a discussion like that, you think, oh, I wish I should have said this. I could have said this part of it. Because after time, my logic is back and I can think more clearly. But if we ever think that listening isn't an active thing that helps someone, this is what you're literally doing for people and how you help their resilience. Listening also bonds this ability to have more empathy, the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. And I know while that sounds soft, for those of you that were on our effective teams webinar, the number one thing in an effective team is psychological safety. This is that empathy that I understand I can share the feelings of another. Uh, I mentioned Viktor Frankl from a purpose aspect. There's probably no better expert as well to talk about empathy than Brene Brown. So I'm going to show you a very short video on the difference between empathy and sympathy. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, Ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah, and we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least, you know, you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Let's take this into a real tool set that you can use. And these two that you've seen, both on the open-ended questions and also the Seek to Understand, we'll provide these as PDFs so you can use these with your team. There is a difference between empathetic responses and non-empathetic responses. Which really I'm trying to help someone increase their resiliency. So if I can think it as they think it, see it as they see it, feel it as they feel it, I can help them work through the change and be more resilient. So empathetic responses fit into these three, care, uh, these three categories understanding, recognizing, and accepting. I hear you, it sounds like what you're saying. Thanks for telling me, as you mentioned. The unempathetic responses, and if you wanna put in the chat one, that the one that you kind of default to here, but there's avoiding, there's judging, and of course there's there's the dominating, right? Hey, look, let's just get on with it, this is what you need to do. But Sarah mentioned this part about forcing the change process, um, just accept it. 
You're not going to change things, so hurry up. Avoiding, you'll be fine. I'm sure we'll all work out um, where the judging party is serious. I wouldn't have done it that way. I tend to default probably into more of the avoiding. Like, look, it's not the end of the world. It'll be fine. Uh, but for someone else, I don't know how they're accepting that. I don't know what change they're going through. And so if I want to help them, especially as a leader, being a resilient leader, I'm going to help someone else with their resiliency. And this is the tool set that you can do to do that. If I were thinking about a musician or someone, and I was thinking, what's the part that says, oh, what's the empathy? What's the quote from someone from an empathetic response? And this would be uh, Jimi Hendrix, one of the greatest guitar players to ever grace this earth. And that is uh, from his song, Fire. I have only one burning desire. Let me stand next to your fire. And that is empathy as told by a... which links to the listening. Um, and one of the questions is, how do you manage through open-ended questions with a group, or do you have to do them all one-on-one -on -one and then as a group? Um, we would offer this as one of your strongest tool sets, both in a group um, and in a one-on-one -on -one scenario. And then another uh, comment in the chat was essentially, um, we don't do this because we kind of fear, what if I don't know the answer? Or maybe it'll take us in a direction um, that we're not prepared to go down. Um, and so we would offer that the, to kind of release the assumption that from a leadership standpoint, I'm required to have all the answers. That one of the best things that you can do um, is actually say, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm hoping you could help me figure that out. Um, that it is appropriate to also continue just to ask open-ended questions. If I don't know the answer, um, can you help me understand your thinking behind that question? Great open-ended question. Um, so we're just kind of back into it. The listening comes in to say, all perhaps the response I need to offer is, tell me more about that. One of the hardest things to do in the webinar format that we've discovered is actually answering the Q&A because we can't ask you all, tell me more about that question. So we're always unsure, am I even answering the right question? Um, so when you link those two tool sets together, they can be incredibly, incredibly powerful. The second piece we want to provide you um, is actually this idea of building work structures. And this links directly to team resiliency. Um, if I'm just in the never ending marathon, I don't know when this is going to end. I don't know when stay at home is going to be lifted. I don't know how long these business pressures are going to last. Um, it can be extremely exhausting. And so how do I break up critical work into key milestones? Um, how do I specifically have conversations around what's in scope and out of scope? How often am I having conversations with team members to be able to say, uh, what's, do you understand the priority of how you're shifting your work from a day basis to a week basis? Um, am I celebrating sub-project completion? Am I not waiting until the very, very end of something in order to be able to celebrate? Um, and how am I leading projects consistently? They all have a similar scope. I'm stating the purpose of the project, kind of those basic essentials. Literally, how am I building the structure so that people can feel like we're being successful, we're getting work done, we're crossing off sub-projects or milestones, we're actually advancing. Um, so this is just a great photo of the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles, and they actually projected um, actually onto the surface of the building, the structure that sits underneath it. Um, so just this idea of what's holding up the work and are we being really consistent in the structure that we're providing for people. Uh, we also love this quote. Um, that resilience is about how you recharge, not necessarily how you endure. Some of the things that get really confused is, can I just have the grit? Can I just withstand? Can I just make it through versus, um, and am I creating opportunities um, for pause? And how am I putting a system around the pause that we're taking? So a few ideas for you, for your team, of how do I embed a recharge? Simple one is do I schedule meetings for 25 or 55 minutes? Essentially, am I giving five minutes of a break so that people can transition between critical work appointments? Um, how am I concluding the week with a short 30-minute team connection? Um, for our team, I will offer that takes the place of a happy hour. And so for the person who put in drink, we're with you. Um, if that's not an option or perhaps you're working in an essential business, you're in a manufacturing environment, you're in a construction environment, I can still pull people together um, and have kind of a conclusion to the week. Can I start team huddles with recognition and celebration, end them with personal connection? I um, encourage people to not leave the personal life out. Um, are we updating people on what's going on with our families? And are we highlighting continually successes and learnings? We send out an email at the end of every week, um, and it's literally called In This Week, and it's a list of every single positive thing that happened, every small thing, every big thing that we accomplished so that people feel like 
meaningful work is being accomplished. And then finally, we know that one of the most powerful tool sets that you have is your willingness and ability to increase recognition. I'm gonna shine a light into every corner of the organization and find those people who are toiling away in relative obscurity. That's a Marcus Buckingham quote. Essentially, people want to know that fundamentally who they are and what they do matters. Recognition, we believe, is your most abundant resource when it is genuine, proportionate, and timely to the activity that took place. We also break it down into these three categories, effort, excellence, and example. In organizations, we tend to recognize a lot of the excellence, the achievement, the winning of the race, the completion of the project, the thing I can see. It's about one third of the things that you can be pointing out. We also wanna be able to point out the effort, so the energy invested along the way, regardless of outcome. Um, so even if it didn't go the way we thought, but tremendous amount of effort was put in, are we recognizing that? And then certainly the example, the embodying of your values. We also encourage people to deliver the recognition in this way, in a very particular formula. I wanna highlight the feelings, I wanna highlight the behavior, and I wanna highlight the impact. Um, so generic example, Jennifer, I'm grateful and inspired by your willingness to ask questions and share your thoughts on how to improve our client communications. Your curiosity and informed contributions make us more collaborative and that serves our clients in even better ways. The reason this is important is it links straight back to this idea of empathy. People want to know, do you see me? And I want to know how you feel about it. That's the empathy connection. Uh, I know this is a positive thing, but it's the literal climbing down into the hole, essentially saying, I am with you. The impact is really, really important because you want start, you want people to start to realize this is the effect that you're having. And sometimes that's not always readily apparent. I want you to do that behavior more. And so the best way I can do that is by telling you, this is what you have caused to happen for other people. I know that during, during our current situation, um, it's a little tricky to figure out how to do this. Um, certainly we can all send a handwritten note in the mail. Um, I realize that the stamp might be what's holding you back. Personally, I only have Christmas stamps, so if you get one from me, it is going to have a Christmas stamp on it. It's just what we're playing with right now. Um, but you can also write the note, take a picture, and text it to the person. Um, by doing that, it basically signals, I took the time to hand write this. Time is the currency of leadership. It meant this much to me that I wrote this out. So an easy way, if you don't even have Christmas stamps, um, to be able to do that. Um, I use TouchNote, which is a postcard app, and so for my grandma who's in quarantine in California, you can go in, you pick the picture on the front, and then you write a, a note, um, you hit the address, and they do all of the hard work for you. There's lots of great apps like that out there that make it really easy. Um, and we love a handwritten note, and we think they're really, really important, uh, but it's also important to be super timely. And so if that's a text or an email, that works. Um, just to say, in the moment, I saw you, I saw the behavior, I appreciate it. Um, and literally when we're doing this and we're doing this well, you, there is not a limit that you can get to. Enough with the genuine recognition, please stop. Uh, and so this is one that you can kind of a lever that you can pull continually to increase the resilience inside your team. All right, so we, next step. Yeah, yeah I'm just going to say okay. as we finish this up uh, on the next steps, Sarah, we have a couple of comments and questions sure. in the chat. Room. So I'm going to take two of them really quickly here. One of them was on the in-scope, out-of-scope, and I saw that Jamie put in a response. This is critical so that you don't have what we would call mission creep or scope creep. In other words, we started with we need basic transportation, and now we're ending up contracting out and trying to buy a Bentley SUV. Um, the out-of-scope is really critical so that other things don't get thrown on it. So not only am I talking about what the project is and then building milestones around it, as Sarah mentioned, and the structure part, but I'm also going to say this is what we are not going to do. So we can finish this part. If it's another project later to do the other parts of it, but that out of scope is really critical. The other question was, how do you, uh, and I'm going to just want to make sure that I read this off, but how do I get people to share their personal life if they're more kind of private? Um, they were mentioned about common in an Asian culture. And having served with a variety of different militaries all over the world, and for Sarah and I doing consulting with organizations all over the world, to include Asia, um, it's a great question. First thing is this, the leader goes first. And I don't mean the leader goes first and shares, especially if I know it's a more private group. I'm not going to share the deepest, darkest things that are going on, but I'm just going to start to provide a little bit about myself at those key inflection points, which are meetings. 
I'm going to go first. I'm going to share some in. I'm going to ask, does anyone else have anything? How are things going? I might ask a very, very easy question. And I'm just going to have a little bit of sharing. I'm going to be very respectful of the cultural difference. And so it might look different if I'm in Ireland versus if I'm in Japan. But in essence, people need to be connected. And so one way I can do this and not just see them for their function is by asking them, how are you doing? How's home going? Um, an easy one, if someone has kids or their spouse or a hobby, those are easy ones to ask. Um, if you want, the other question we really like that gets into more personal is, can you tell me something about your job that no one knows, but you wish they did? And they'll start to open up a little bit about their professional life. You said, that, that's great. Share something about your life first though, and they can follow suit. I think that was the two that I had in there, sir, if you want to wrap us up with the next steps. All right, just a roundup of some of the suggestions that we went through from an individual standpoint. I'm going to focus my energy, my time, my focus on things that I can control and influence. Um, I'm going to reframe the question. I, it's not a, a change that any of us would have selected our current uh, COVID situation, but what opportunities does this present? Um, how can I make decisions based on values and purpose as something that can recenter? How can I find that meaning? Um, how can I ask the question, what can be learned or what can be repurposed or made better? Um, how do I apply that ingenuity um, to the current situation? Um, during times of change, which we are in, I'm going to do my best to provide some choice. Um, the actual change itself, perhaps I can't choose that. But within the change, am I going to create some opportunities for people to choose elements of it? Perhaps it's the timing, perhaps it's the order, uh, perhaps it's who goes first. Um, I'm going to ask for feedback. Um, I'm I, it's scary, but I'm going to use some open-ended questions. I'm going to ask, how can we make this idea better? I'm going to ask, what concerns do I have? And I'm going to feel comfortable saying, that is a great question. I just don't know the answer to that. Um, as a team, we're going to listen with empathy. Um, we're going to build structures, and structures allow people to access the work, get work done, and celebrate the milestones that happen. I'm going to incorporate some elements of recharging. I'm going to build that into the system and structure and I'm gonna increase recognition and celebration to pour some resilience back into my team. Yeah, thanks, sir. And as we look at a little bit of this and feedback, first feedback we're gonna ask for, and really quickly, this is 1974, I believe. This is the quote unquote wall of sound by the Grateful Dead. And so when we think about feedback, this is you all first, giving it to each other. So I'm back into Menti, and could you just do me a favor? It's the usual question that we ask, and that is, what have you learned or will do differently as a result of this webinar? The reason we ask this and for you to put this in, and I know it's a little challenging if you're typing in your phone, but it allows you all, the 160 people that we have on this webinar right now, to see what ideas other people are doing from this. So I know it's a little bit of effort, but very much appreciate this because a lot of the learnings of this happen from what you all say to each other. And we'll read a few of these off. I'll read a couple in the survey as well. But I love the ask more open ended questions. I'm telling you, that can change your relationships, not only at work, uh, but at home. And I don't just mean it like this soft skill way. I mean, from a performance aspect as well, and asking open ended questions, you get so much better information and you allow other people the same. And a lot of comments on empathy as well. All right, we see it coming in, tell me more about that. It is such a great default phrase, especially if you feel like, man, I am backed in a corner. I'm not 100% sure what to do from a leadership. So like, tell me more about where you're coming from. Um, get, get the person talking more. I mean, you start to understand the question behind the question. Uh, the recharge, um, how am I creating those essentially plug-in stations for people um, to get a little bit of their energy back? Um, how am I recognizing the effort? Um, that one is really, really powerful. And you think about from a resilience standpoint, if I've just been through something and the outcome wasn't I, what I expected, um, the way you shorten that recovery time is by saying, hold on, what can we learn from this? What good came out of it? Um, and what, how can we apply that good? Um, some, some great examples. Appreciate y'all putting those in. Yeah, and we will download the Mentimeter. So if you're still in it, please keep putting those inputs in. We'll download that. We get it into a PDF and we'll send that out to you as well by close of business today. Now it's time for feedback for us, if you don't mind. I know we're up against time right at the hour, and I've launched that poll question, sir, if you can confirm that it actually yep. is up and running, great. And so if you don't mind, please, please, please give us some feedback on how you like today's session. Um, I'm looking for, and sir, can you check on the Q&A for me really quick as I move us into just a few last slides here. This is number six of seven in the series, so we have one other additional 
uh, med, uh, webinar we are doing. We might put a bonus track on, expect that net announcement to come this week. Uh, on Thursday, we're doing the accountability playlist. We've done a lot of work on both care and accountability. So how do I care for people? But at the same time, like, guys, we got a business to run. We need to get some stuff done. Um, that's the work that we're going to do. We're going to lead you through the, the six areas that we work with our clients on. So that'll be a fun one. That's this Thursday. Uh, in addition, and I love this phrase, like every good band has a, has a has some guest artists. We have Chris and Hadid coming in next Wednesday, I believe it is, May 6th, at 12 p.m. Central Daylight Time. She's a fantastic person, wrote permission to screw up, runs the group Student May, and is a very, very vocal on social media about some things. I know we're at time here, so do we have any other questions we need to handle on this one, or are we good? I just want to note um, for Susan, who's out there, can we get recordings and PDFs of some webinars we've missed? All the recordings are on our website, so you can access those immediately. And if you would like uh, the PDF of the slides, once you view that, just reach out and we'll make sure that we get that to you. Um, there is a question in the Q&A, and I'm just going to say right now that I don't feel qualified to answer it. Matt might have a response, uh, but just to acknowledge that it was asked, how will the politics in Washington, D.C. affect all these COVID issues? And my answer to that is dramatically. I, my answer to that is they will put you in the box. <laughs> yes, they will put you in the box. So apologize, yeah. we just not qualified to answer that one. Um, but appreciate yeah. all the comments, all the questions, um, and you all tuning in.